Hey everyone, welcome back. Hope you're doing well. It's week three. Here we go. When we left things off last week, one of the things that I said at the end of the lecture about the aim of our evangelism was that we had to think about kids in quadrant four, the disinterested kids with very low exposure to Christianity. And one of the things I said was that we needed a, a theological framework for shaping missional outreach to adolescents. Uh, missional outreach is rooted in an understanding of the mission of God. And this might be terminology that's familiar to you, and that's great if it is. But I'm going to share throughout this time here a, a framework of, of the mission of God so that we're all kind of operating on the same page. In fact, I did put in the, uh, the Canvas uh, module there a, a handout that you can print out that has kind of my, my framework, my big picture view of the mission of God. So if you'd like to print that out and have it with you, you could take some notes on it on the way. might be helpful. We'll use that a couple times during this week here. But before we get too far into that, a, a story, a passage of scripture in the Gospels that I'm sure you're familiar with, when Jesus encounters the woman caught in adultery. You know the story. They bring The Pharisees bring a woman to Jesus. They're trying to trap him. He, he wiggles out of the trap in a, in a genius sort of move. And, and then ultimately, as he uh, uncovers the, the conspiracy that these guys have put up against this woman here, uh, they drop their stones, they walk away. Jesus says, where are your accusers? Are there any left? And, and she says, none, sir. And then he says, then neither do I condemn you. A beautiful moment. In many ways, I think this is a salvation moment, a punctiliar moment, we might say, as the as the Puritans were always on the look for. When was the moment that you were converted or changed? Well, I think it's right here for this woman. And then he says, from now on, do not sin anymore. Uh, he is inviting her into a whole new life, life the way it was meant to be. But I have this question for you. I wonder if you have had experiences where you've had kids in ministry who said they believe that Jesus died for their sins, but they never seem to get much traction with discipleship after that. They're, they seem to be okay with their assurance of salvation, but they're not very motivated uh, beyond that. I think oftentimes, whether we intend this or not, we perpetuate the gospel as a, as a transactional salvation. Accept Jesus and then your sins are forgiven. Or from that point forward, they, they, they seem to be okay with that transactional view of their salvation, but they feel like they're constantly failing moving forward at discipleship. They feel like they're, they're screwing up all the time. They believe now it's their job to, to leave their life of sin and stop doing the bad stuff. Seems like in a lot of ways, go and leave your life of sin is the de facto stopping point for evangelism. It's not what we should be doing. It's not even probably what we mean to be doing. Uh, but however, we can reduce our gospel message down if we take it out of its out of the context of its theological framework. It, it will devolve into that. It, it's 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 uh, ultimately because our gospel telling our, our telling of the gospel is not robust enough to invite kids into more than a transaction. Because we don't take into account the, the long story of God at work throughout history. We need the, the rest of that kingdom story to begin to infuse our overall picture, our theological framework, you will, for, for ministry. There are a number of theologians who've come to thing here. They've said... These kind of things here. Dallas Willard. What is ordinarily heard as the message given, and he means a, a presentation of the gospel, does not lead the hearer who tries to respond into a life of discipleship to Jesus Christ. Accordingly, the personal and social transformation that is so clearly anticipated in the biblical writers rarely becomes real. N.T. Wright says the gospel is the story of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth told as the climax of the long story of Israel which in turn is how the one true God is rescuing the world. And then lastly, Scott McKnight says, the plan of salvation can't be preached apart from the story, the gospel story. When we separate the plan of salvation from the story, we cut ourselves off from the story that identifies us and tells us our past and tells us our future. 
We separate ourselves from Jesus and turn the Christian faith into a system of salvation. As I said before in an earlier lecture, we are, I think, mostly adept at talking about what freedom from sin looks like, that Jesus died on the cross to rescue us from our sin. And I think we, we believe that we can articulate what we're freed into, but it's usually things like abundant life without much of a definition or an experience to offer or uh, being a new creation, which again is a beautiful truth, but it tends to reside in kind of the abstract and not as much in a concrete reality, like come live a new life with us. And that's what these authors and thinkers and theologians are getting at here. So what is this theological framework that paints the picture, that, that gives us something to aim for, that, that shows us the trajectory, not only of evangelism, but also discipleship as well too. Here, there's something a little bit odd. I'm not sure if you are a cricket fan. I'm not. I don't know really anything about cricket. I'm a sports fan though, so I get the gist of this. I pulled this off the, the internet not too long ago. It was a test match apparently between Australia and South Africa back in 2014. And this is a picture here. I found this on ESPN.com slash cricket. It's really there, forward slash cricket. So, so apparently, uh, South Africa and Australia uh, met in a test match, and Australia wraps up the victory. So you see that depicted right there. Well, you know, from looking at that picture and that little caption below there, I get the gist of what's happened. Australia's wrapped up the victory. Great, okay. I got the basic idea, right? But since I don't really know much about cricket, I'm really missing out on a whole lot more of the story. I don't know the nuance of the game. I don't really know exactly what these guys are celebrating other than the match. I don't even know what that guy on all fours is down on the ground for. I'm not sure what he's wearing or why. I just know in general, Australia's won. That guy on the ground is probably a South African. He lost. If I knew more about cricket, then I could appreciate the significance of this event. I would know from the past and it might even point to where things are headed from here. So I decided to go a little deeper here. I decided to read the transcript of the game, the announcers announcing the game. And this is no joke. The actual commentary, the transcript of the announcers. So I thought I would read this to you to see if it helped fill in the blanks for you with regard to what happens in this cricket match. So just sit back and pretend like I'm an announcer reading uh, or, or, or announcing play-by-play -play in a cricket match. Siddle to Philander, six. Another pull shot, and this time he connects well enough to clear deep square leg. A little bit of late defiance. Siddle to Philander, no run, full and angling into the stumps. Defended to mid on. Siddle to Philander, no run, fuller, defended off the back foot. Siddle to Philander, no run, 140 kilometers per hour. Tries again, but it's shorter and beats the top edge. Siddle to Philander, four, strong pull shot, picked up the length early and crunched it through square leg. Well, how about that? We've got some of the terminology now. We, we've got some actual transcript from the game. Does that change things for you? More about what's happened here in light of uh, the language of the event that actually happened? See, for me, I'm probably more confused than I was before because I don't understand the language. I don't know what all those terms mean. All I can really tell is, okay, so, uh, so it looks like uh, Australia won a match. Well, I hope what this does for us is illustrate the fact that if we're thinking about people in the, in the fourth quadrant, little interest uh, and very little exposure, we have to, to, to be significantly deeper thinkers about how to make this relevant for them because otherwise for them they could know just a general thing about Christianity, think they've got the story, and they could move on. In a number of ways I think we have made evangelism simply about uh, the story, the victory here, the, and we've never really talked about um, or, or never really incorporated a, a larger theological understanding of the trajectory of God at work. And the problem with this, this is that in those quotes that we saw before is that it might resonate to some degree with people, but it doesn't, and it might work, quote unquote, 
I'm doing air quotes right now. It might work in terms of, evangel of evangelism, but it doesn't lead to discipleship. And those two things are never meant to be segregated or separated. They're part of one event. That's how the early church understood it, and that's how it So what we need is an understanding of the mission of God. It's our theological framework for understanding uh, what our mission is in outreach and evangelism. So let's think of it this way. There's a long arc, a long storyline of God at work in the world. We'll call it the mission of God. Some people call it God's meta narrative. They call it the grand narrative. Uh, they call it God's larger story. Uh, many synonyms for this idea of the mission of God or the Latin phrase that I like, the missio dei. It can be explained in in five acts, uh, like a play. So act one would be creation. And you know, you're familiar with this. God created the world. He created the stuff of the world out of nothing. And then, then he got his hands involved in it and he fashioned things in the earth. The pinnacle of that creation would be human beings. And all of, all of creation God made with a particular bent to it. Human beings were made in his image to reflect out into the world uh, God's agenda for life the way it was meant to be. Uh, we call this shalom. It, it's translated peace, but as we said before, it really means much more than peace. It means flourishing, wholeness, delight, and peace. And that's the, that's the trajectory or the intent for creation. It was meant to move along in shalom. It's got a trajectory to it. Now, human beings were created for certain things as image bearers. They were created to do or be or exist in a certain way, not statically, but dynamically, alive and living out the reality of the image of God. So we're made in God's image for a few key things. But before I talk about those together, I, I want to take a little bit of a diversion here to see if I can use uh, one of my daughters has really gotten into Harry Potter. I don't know if you're a Harry Potter fan, if you ever were a Harry Potter fan, but I have to confess, I never was. I never read Harry Potter stories. I never watched any of the movies. Just wasn't interested. Sorry if you're judging me for that, or maybe you're like me. Either way. But in general, I sense that I had a decent understanding of what Harry Potter was about. It's about this little kid down there with the round glasses who was at a school called Hogwarts that was training him to be a wizard and that he was encountering you know, evil wizards and the dark forces of the wizard world and he'd have these good versus evil fights and he'd kind of come out on top. I had a general sense of what was happening there. But what I've come to learn in reading Harry Potter books because my daughter is excited about them, she wants to read them, okay, we read them together is that Harry Potter has got a story of origin that has a significant shape on the way he behaves or what he does. And if you are not familiar with Harry Potter, if you look on his forehead, you can see he's got this little scar right there. It's this lightning bolt shaped scar. It came about because uh, he was born into a wizarding family and he was a unique child at his birth and one of the dark uh, lords of the wizarding world didn't want this unique, new, powerful child to be born into the world, tried to kill him, but couldn't. But in his attack, he left this scar on Harry's forehead. So now he's marked out as the Harry Potter, the one we've heard about, this legend. Uh, he was the one who was able to withstand the evil, dark wizard. It's part of his, his legacy but it also explains why he's always so willing to be courageously uh, investigating or engaging in, in, uh, in mysterious undertakings at Hogwarts or why he's always willing to fight against evil forces there too. It's, it's what drives him. This little image, this little uh, mark on Harry Potter tells us why he's driven the way that he is. Okay, a little bit of a diversion in a where we were here. We're created in the image of God. This is the point I want to make. Genesis 1, 26 to 27 says this. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move on the earth. God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. 
male and female he created them this is the truth about us as human beings we're marked in a similar way Harry Potter was marked and the mark of God on us being created in his image means that we have relationality we have a connection to God and we can relate to him but we also have the ability to respond to him we have the ability to respond to uh, to the intent of God for our life so let me show you how this plays out when we get back to our chart here well and I, and I, this this point's important as well too adolescents do they know they're made in the image of God maybe not but they have this sense deep down inside of them and you can ask them I've done this so many times but I've said you know deep down in your bones you are made for more and not less don't you I've never had a kid to, that said to me no nope, I was really made for less they go yeah I, I do have this sense maybe they've never known how to put it into words but they go yeah I, I do have the sense I was made for more well the sensation this deep resonance with that idea is a confirmation that they were created in God's image it's the indication that it's there they resonate with it by virtue of the fact that they're created in God all right let's get back to unfolding our big framework right here so adolescents are made in the image of God they're marked with the image of God on them it has implications for what we do or how we live kind of similar to Harry Potter I might have gone a little too far with the Harry Potter analogy just kind of work with me there I say adolescents are created in the image of God all human beings were but particularly adolescents okay so they're made in God's image for something what are they made for well first of all they're made for worship <clears throat> human beings are made for worship what does that mean it means that we have a capacity for awe it means that we have this embedded desire this impulse in us to give ourselves to something bigger than ourselves this was from the beginning in Genesis 2 and God created human beings he, he gave them all these uh, bountiful things uh, for for their uh, enjoyment and for their sustenance put a few boundary lines around them and established the fact that he's their creator he was the provider the prohibitor the creator you worship you give your allegiance to something that's all three of those things and that's what that's what human beings are created for we have a, a an impulse that can't be stopped we can't not give our allegiance to something bigger than ourselves because we're searching for something that will tell us back what we're worth how valuable we are human beings are also created with a kind of authority uh, we were authorized to be God's agents to move creation along according to this trajectory of Shalom creation wasn't static it was meant to go somewhere and God gave human beings the authority to to move it along according to his wise order in the, in the in the nature of Shalom according to the flourishing wholeness and delight of Shalom and then lastly human beings were made for relationships again Genesis 2 shows us this this was not a solitary effort by one human being but that God established relationships as a dimension of establishing or, or giving generating human identity and dignity so uh, it begins in male female relationships but this is the building block for community uh, a, a, a measure of identity is uh, is generated by these kind of relationships that they made the way they were meant to be this is essentially the the trajectory of Shalom for human beings by virtue of the fact that they're created in the image of God okay well you know what act two is act two is the fall this is where sin enters into the story and this disrupts and severely distorts everything about the Shalom of creation so you see the little arrow there of Shalom darkens and now from this point forward all of creation journeys along in a distorted manner what does this mean for for being created in the image of God it means that the image of God now is distorted severely distorted in human beings so that that beautiful impulse for worship is now disrupted and distorted so that it becomes a impulse uh, to give allegiance or loyalty to anything less than God which is idolatry what about authority or power now that impulse is used not to bring rightness into the world and, and, and justice it's now used and oriented towards oppression making others 
other people, other things smaller or misusing them so that we feel bigger or better. And then what about our relationships where well, they're not primarily oriented towards bringing identity or dignity to one another. They're now characterized by exploitation. Using others, consuming others, ripping them off to meet our own needs. That's what happens. Okay, so this is a severe distortion and disruption in what God had intended. Now, especially with regard to human beings, the image of God in them no longer leads them to flourishing and wholeness and delight. It's a continuous trajectory of dehumanization, which leads to death. <clears throat> this is a problem. This is a bad thing. But even though sin has wrecked the beauty, the beauty and the trajectory of creation, this is not the point where God checks out, where God says, sin's wrecked the world. I'm walking away. I can't have any contact with this broken, sin-infested world. In fact, what God says is now I will roll up my sleeves and I'll enter into the fray. So what does God do? Well, this is Act 3. God begins a mission of rescue, redemption, and renewal that you see at the top arrow above or next to mission, the mission of God. <clears throat> Act 3 is Israel. He creates a people for himself. He creates a people uh, for himself for this purpose. He says, I will dwell among you. I'll show you the way of life to live and you will be my people. Not to be exclusive, not to be inwardly focused and not to pretend like you're sort of like the, the teacher's pet. No, the purpose of Israel was to be the people of God to reflect out into the rest of the world the way life could be in God's presence. Worship properly aligned, authority, authority properly used towards rightness, relationships that generate dignity and flourishing. And this is what God's intent for Israel was. But you know, of course, that Israel has struggled through this mission. When you read uh, the prophets, <clears throat> you'll find in the Old Testament that the prophets were constantly calling the people back to essentially these three things below. Uh, where, where there was idolatry, they were saying, Israel, Realign your worship to the one true God who has saved you thus far. With regard to their oppression, Israel, stop abusing your powers. Stop using your, abusing your powers and particularly um, taking advantage of those who are powerless. Israel, take note of your relationships. Stop using others to meet your own needs, particularly the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner. These were the themes of the prophets. They, were, they weren't introducing new ideas to Israel. They were calling Israel back to their initial trajectory. Israel ignores and ignores and ignores. So now God brings this, this storyline to a crescendo. It's act four. He sends Jesus. And Jesus comes to complete this mission of Israel. It's not a, it's not a plan B like God tried real hard with Israel. They kind of messed it up. So now he's got to go to Jesus. No, this was the plan all along. Jesus is the crescendo, the peak, or the completion of Israel's story. So through the death and resurrection of Jesus, now this story can be renewed. Here's how this works. You know, of course, that the death of Jesus on the cross is the means by which human beings are set free from the distorting, disrupting, dehumanizing, and, and, and death row implications of, uh, of, of the effects of sin. Human beings can be set free from uh, the, the distorting and dehumanizing and ultimately what kills us um, effects of sin. But it's the resurrection of Jesus that's a significant part of the story. Of course, you know this. The resurrection, though, is not just that Jesus has victory over death, although it's that. And it's not just that. Jesus now proves there's life after death. The resurrection is also the moment where the Holy Spirit enters into the story. If you remember in John 20, we talked about this in week one, that what we call the other great commission. Jesus gathers with his disciples in the upper room after the crucifixion and the resurrection. And he breathes his spirit on them. He says shalom to them, by the way, a little foreshadow. And then he says, in the same way the Father has sent me, I now send you. In the same way the Father sent Jesus to be the completion of Israel's story, to live out life the way it was meant to be. Now I empower you through the Holy Spirit. I reconstitute you, so to speak, to be the people of God. So this is Act 5. This is the resurrection life that we're invited into now. And it's not just 
hey, here's a good way to live. Here's some powerful uh, advice for how to live life right. It is the renewing work of the Holy Spirit that makes this happen. And what this means now, of course, is that Jesus has renewed the trajectory. It's not a brand new trajectory out of nowhere. If it's, it's actually a renewal of this original trajectory. And it's a renewal towards life the way it was meant to be. This trajectory is characterized once again by shalom. Where's it going to go? Well, we know this. It ends with God finishing the work that he promises in Revelation 21.5 of making all things new. So here's the long mission of God. And this is the mission of God that, that everyone, including adolescents, is invited into. But let me show you why this is significant for adolescents. We've emphasized a lot about creation, about being created in the image of God. Uh, this is a significant dimension to the mission of God that's often forgotten or, or, or de-emphasized, intentionally or not, in, uh, in our understanding of what ministry is. But let's, go, but let's look psychosocially at adolescents. Adolescents are driven in this transitional period from, from childhood into adulthood by some developmental task. At one level, it's just answering the question, who am I? And that plays itself out in a few key tasks. Uh, you, can, you can read these in, in Hurt 2.0 from Chap Clark, but a number of uh, sociologists and psychologists will, will say similar sort of things. They're trying to resolve the question of identity, who am I? Well, that question of identity in many ways, really expresses a deeper theological longing, the longing to worship something that will tell me that I have worth. They're also driven by a, a, a psychosocial task of autonomy. They want to know that their newfound autonomy as they're growing uh, matters, that their decisions can do something. Well, if you think about this, that that psychosocial impulse, that task of autonomy, learning that my decisions matter or that I have some power, really just reflects a deeper theological longing uh, of authority, that, that human beings were created for using the authorization God has given them to make things right in the world. So they get to participate in rightness if their developmental longing or task of autonomy is rightly oriented. And then thirdly, they, there's, there's the de developmental task of belonging. Where do I fit in? And if you think about that, this just resonates or reflects a deeper theological longing for relationships rightly ordered towards dignity. What I'm really saying here is <clears throat> that this mission of God dovetails beautifully with the developmental task of adolescence so that if they are invited into the renewing work of the Holy Spirit so that their worship and their authority and their relationships are rightly ordered, it will help them resolve these developmental tasks of identity, autonomy, and belonging so that in the end, their core lives are shaped by shalom, flourishing, wholeness, and delight. This is a bit of a picture of how the mission of God is meant to be our theological framework for, for missional or outreach ministry. Now, adolescents have developmental longings as well. And, and what these are, they're similar to their, their psychosocial tasks, but these are just things that they might be able to, to resonate because they kind of reside just below the surface here. And I'm, I'm gonna put these here for you because it, as we talk about communicating, to adolescents when we're specifically talking to or speaking in front of adolescent audiences, we may want to use these other descriptors for their psychosocial task of identity, autonomy, and belonging. So these are just things for you to file away. They're on your page there, that handout that I've given you. But it's this, adolescents have this, this developmental longing to, be, to belong, to matter, to be taken seriously for a safe place, to be uniquely me, to be wanted, for hope. These are all things they feel at, at a level. And part of this is that they're, you, they're just intensely sensitive to these longings because they're in this transitional stage from childhood into adulthood. We'll come back to these. I just wanted you to be aware of why they're on that, that handout that I've given you there. We started with this. This is just an event, a story. And in general, we can understand the data. Australia wins, South Africa loses. 
but that doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't tell us the point. We need to know the language. We need to know the trajectory. We need to know the grand narrative of God that helps us understand what we were made for, what the death and resurrection of Jesus renews us into, and how that intersects with the developmental life of an adolescent. This is the larger story that informs the story of you, of me, of every adolescent and anyone else that we encounter. And this is going to be our theological framework for understanding what we do in ministry. And it's going to have a particular emphasis on being created in the image of God of this for now. And I'm going to close with these for you. Adolescents were made in the image of God. They have the capacity to relate to God. Every adolescent does. They have the capacity to respond to God. What we said before was the response ability. They know in their bones they were made for more and not less. They may not be able to articulate their capacity to relate to God or their capacity to respond to God, but all you have to do is ask them, do you know deep down inside you were made for more and not less? And they'll tell you, I do. That just bears witness to or bears evidence that they're created in the image of God. It's there in them. It's devastatingly distorted, but it's still, there's a flicker of it still inside there, and they know it. So nothing that they do now or have done or, or has been done to them can mar that image beyond recognition. Now, there may be certainly times as we encounter kids we might call quadrant four kids who have no interest in Christianity and they have no exposure to it at all and they seem downright in opposition. We may not recognize that these are image bearers, but God always does. Adolescents were made to do the image of God. They were made to join in with this trajectory of the image of God. So they're made for worship, allegiance. They're made with a kind of authority. They're made to use their authority to participate in rightness. And they're made for completing relationships, relationships that generate dignity, uh, that give us a, a, a significant dimension of what it means to be human. So in order to reach out to adolescents, especially those in that quadrant four, we have to understand what they're made for. This means we need a robust understanding of the doctrine of creation and specifically what it means to be created in the image of God. We also need to understand how sin has wrecked them, that they are utterly trapped by the distorting and dehumanizing effects of sin. And there, there's no neutral space. They're on a trajectory of dehumanization that leads to death. But we also need to understand what a redeemed life looks, from, looks like. The life they are invited into, life the way it was meant to be, that resonates with what they were originally created for. All right, those are some of the ideas that we're going to start unpacking more and more as we move through. So we're going to talk a little more about our theological framework. The next lecture will dive into at an even deeper level uh, the implications of being created in the image of God and what that means for, for reaching out to adolescents, especially those in Quadrant 4.